before we begin, I, I want to say two things. One is I want to acknowledge Les, uh, who I consider to be the subject area expert on this um, committee. And I know how hard you have worked on our behalf and on Johnny's behalf. Uh, he told me that you emailed him this morning suggesting edits. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, that's a model for, for all of us. Thank you. And uh, Rich also needs to say this is an area of uh, interest, particularly violence, if not nonviolence. Certainly, violence is something that Rich has been talking and writing about for many, many, many decades. What, the second thing that I want to say is just how, how personally proud I am of this, of this moment. Um, I met Johnny in uh, Conflict 501, the first session of the master's program. He was a, a master's student. And after that first session, he came to me and said, well, OK, now what I really want to do is I want to do the PhD, and I want to do it on a project that integrates Dr. King's theory of nonviolence in the field of conflict analysis and resolution. And I said, S sounds great. Uh, I'm late. It's 10 o'clock. <laughs> I didn't quite do it that way. Close to it, though. <laughs> but Johnny persevered. I knew at the time that it was, in fact, a both a major intellectual and conceptual undertaking. Um, and that it would demand of Johnny, who knew the civil rights uh, literature and, and Dr. King's writings quite well, but starting out in what was for him a new field, the first night of the MS program, that it would demand his mastery of at least another two or three literatures, including, as it turned out, critical theory. Mm -hmm. uh, Johnny persevered, and he did his uh, master's thesis on it, and it was a stepping stone to uh, this this project. So, um, what I want to say is, besides being personally proud of you, it is something objectively to be proud of when you start out with this vision several years ago, and you bring it to fruition. So. Thank you, Kevin. So, having said that. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, I'm so pleased that you would take the time, those of you who have really given your time, um, to share with me what obviously is an exciting moment. And I, you, you, there are some preliminaries I can't help myself with, and you know, it, it obviously is to say thank you to so many people. Uh, most of them are in this room, a couple of them are not. Um, my journey, as uh, Dr. Abrook indicated, uh, was one that um, I knew clearly from the very beginning what I wanted to do. Um, as <laughs> Dr. Abrook understood then, I had no clue what I was getting into. Um, and uh, it, it took some time and some iterations on the master's thesis and quite a bit of time here and now. But you know, I'm here because of, of, of so many people, but a couple of people that I really just have to, to mention. And they're in this room. Um, they're just incredible. Of course, my committee, I, I have to thank my committee, so I should start there. Um, I, I, you know, I have the all-star committee, you know, particularly for my field, to have Lester Kurtz, you know, who is who is a name in the field of nonviolence. He's a sociologist, but if you read about, if you read anything about nonviolence, you're gonna run across Lester Curtis. And to have him uh, here at, at, at George Mason, but particularly to serve on my committee was just fantastic. And then Rich Rubenstein. Rich, I never told you this, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm not the youngest uh, PhD candidate here at, uh, at SCAR not the youngest to come through the doors. But when I was an undergrad, 
James Cone is a is a uh, is you know one of my heroes. Much of his writings and uh, his liberation theology book uh, I read in undergrad. I did undergrad in two majors. One was business and the other was theology. I'm not quite sure how that happened, but it happened. But but nonetheless, in reading Cone's book, I read about a guy named Rubenstein. And Cone was uh, referring to uh, some of his thinking. And uh, I recall it so well. And in doing research for this dissertation, I run across the book again and came to realize that the Rubenstein in this 1970 book on liberation theology was the one and only Richard Rubenstein. And it's just uh, incredible. Um, I could say a lot more, but I, I know my committee chair wants me to move on. But my it's chick. 10 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Abruck is, you know, everybody ought to have Kevin Abruck as a chair if you can stomach it. It's, he's, uh, <laughs> he is, uh, you know, He'll bring the, the best out of you, and I hope that you'll see that. Um, Kevin will not settle for anything other than what ought to be produced, and I appreciate that very much, Kevin. I appreciate your pushing and, and making sure that, um, that you know, I, I dotted the I's and crossed the T's. I didn't get them all, as you know, but uh, thank you so much for agreeing to serve as my chair. Okay, quickly, there are two others that I just have to mention. Um, Sandy Sheldon. I wouldn't, I just wouldn't be here if it were not for Sandy. She just, as you know, everybody who's come through, Terrence, I'm sorry, but you know, you've got some huge shoes to fill here. <laughs> as, as, she's just been incredible to so many. And um, Sandy, it's nice to see you here. Thank you for, for, for being my champion in so many ways. And then, and then there's my colleague, uh, my friend, surprised me uh, over the last 24, 48 hours and said, I'm coming uh, to fly all the way from Nepal for this, these few moments. It's just incredible. Um, frankly, I didn't know about uh, ICAR then until uh, we engaged uh, or asked Dr. Uh, Andrea Bartoli for an expert in, in uh, conflict, and particularly the Sri Lankan uh, conflict. And we got the name uh, Maneska Eliotambi. And uh, Maneska provided some incredible work when I was working with the Martin Luther King Center and an organization called Realizing the Dream. The expert referred to us was Maneska, and we became friends. She eventually helped me to co-found Communities Without Boundaries and has been a, a great friend. But I would not be here today without, without Maneska's um, example, influence, and uh, Friendship. So thank you so much, Vanessa, for taking the time. So I've already spent uh, half my time with the preliminaries. I, um, my dissertation title, After Confrontation, Then What? Nonviolence as a Theory of Social Change and Human Development for the Peace and Conflict Field. Again, the short title, After Confrontation, Then What? I got that title just within, I've been working on this for several years now, but I, I got the, the title several weeks ago, frankly, uh, maybe for months. But in, in, in reviewing some materials in my chair's uh, most recent book, his uh, 2012 book, uh, Dr. Avruk uh, asks this question in the middle of a book, in the middle of a chapter, after, he doesn't quite ask it this way, but after all the hoopla and all the noise, all, all of the um, protest, whatever it is that an individual or a group might do in order to seek to bring peace, to resolve a conflict, after using confrontation, then what? And so that it is with nonviolence, as you'll see in my presentation. Nonviolence has several uh, meanings, several definitions, and it's viewed in several different ways. My interest was uh, particularly what nonviolence has to do with the peace and conflict field. And uh, frankly, why isn't it central to the field? Um, and I frankly was quite astonished to learn how peripheral the idea has been for, in my judgment, too long in the field. Not only nonviolence itself, but particularly nonviolence as espoused by Martin Luther King Jr. 
Indeed, Dr. King's work is referenced now and then in literature, but uh, his work does not tend to be, as nonviolence does not tend to be uh, core uh, to uh, the logic of peace and conflict. And so my interest was to examine nonviolence as a theory of change for peace and conflict, and particularly that of Martin Luther King, Jr. And so um, I argue that nonviolence is not only underutilized, but also under-theorized, and thus not wholly understood in the field of peace and conflict. Using the work and writings of Dr. King in the mid-20th century U.S. Civil Rights Movement, I conducted a qualitative research uh, to examine nonviolence as a theory of change for the field. And so my basic hypothesis is that Martin Luther King's logic of nonviolence offers a theory of change that is responsive to peace and conflict. However, his work has not been systematically examined heretofore in the field of peace and conflict. It has been examined in many other areas, but even when his, his work has been examined, it, it's been more of a biographical and, an, and a historical look. Uh, very little critical uh, examination of his theory and praxis has been done. And so I hope that this contribution will be meaningful to the field. So I'll start with uh, my findings. Uh, Dr. King, I, I argue, in many respects, is often confused with a different king, with another king. Uh, when you think about the, the king holiday, for example, a day on versus a day off, a day is attributed to the work of Dr. King. But Dr. King's work, uh, he was a prolific writer uh, uh, in philosophy and sociology and theology, very broad and and, and deep uh, thinker as well as uh, obviously an actionist uh, a, um, and, and, and heavy in praxis as we know in terms of the civil rights movement. The findings I, I come to from this uh, study is Dr. King roots his theory of social change, his theory of nonviolence, his nonviolence logic in what I call social change and human development, the whole social change and development framework. And I argue that one cannot fully understand nonviolence, and particularly King's particular logic of nonviolence, without rooting it and framing it within the context of social change, how societies uh, evolve over time, how its systems and structures and policies and practices come to mediate uh, human interaction and human relations. So uh, that leads to several points about King's work, again, that have not been fully examined, which I do, including what he calls the battering rams. King uh, often refers to this idea that the battering rams of peaceable power, the second uh, idea that you see uh, in under King in nonviolence, to create what King calls a revolution of value. He wants to see society change, and he argues it can only be changed through a revolution of values. So I ask the question, what are these values? And why use the word revolution? What is he really after? King argues that the, this revolution of values is three. It is personhood, freedom, and community. When most people think about Dr. King's work, and they think about the principles and values of Kingian nonviolence, they often come to what are called King's Six Principles of Nonviolence. But my work uh, points or makes the point that even beyond the six principles, and there are also six steps of nonviolence, King is more concerned about these three fundamental ideas. Personhood is the concept of personalism, the idea that every human has inherent and equal dignity and worth with respect to every other human being. With that dignity and worth comes a certain element of freedom that every human ought to be able to freely exercise that dignity and worth and pursue their greatest potential. With that, with my freedom, as long as it is only me, I am free to do anything and everything that I have the power to do. But as soon as another comes into view, 
then my freedom ends where that other begins. And that then invokes the idea of community. And so these three, personhood, freedom, and community, are core to the calculus of King's logic of nonviolence. This idea uh, is, has not been previously understood in uh, literature regarding Martin Luther King's work. Also in my findings are thoughts about nonviolence itself. And I argue that nonviolence is really a metalogic. That is, in the same way as we will see shortly with violence, nonviolence manifests as three very discrete but interrelated ideas. And those discrete but interrelated ideas are direct, structural, and cultural. So there is direct nonviolence. I argue there's structural nonviolence. And I argue there's cultural nonviolence. Those familiar with uh, the literature in our field, and, and particularly of Johann Galtung, will find a direct relationship between his concept of um, the nonviolence triangle and direct structural and cultural violence. And so I juxtapose or counterpose, if you will, uh, the, the two spectrums of violence and nonviolence, as we'll see in a moment. The third is civil society. Essential to the idea of nonviolence in this new metalogic framework, if I can call it that, is axial processes using the case study of the U.S. Civil Rights Movement, as I mentioned in the outset, I identify what are organic processes, change processes, axial processes that occur in the civil rights community, indeed in the broader African American community, as uh, African Americans sought to gain their freedom here in the United States and throw off the fetters of apartheid, American apartheid. Using these axial processes, um, they become element of this framework of nonviolence and its three forms of direct structural and cultural. As well, another term not previously uh, addressed, at least within our field, is the idea that if the state has a monopoly on violence, that is, if the state converts violence into a governing process in order to create a civil community, a civil society, and citizens of the state give up their right to violence, all against all, if you will, in that environment, then the citizen has a monopoly on nonviolence, I argue. Indeed, that is the fulcrum of the third form of nonviolence. And it leads to cultural action and civility. <clears throat> so I had to grapple with three issues, three problems, three arguments that I make. Nonviolence cannot be wholly understood without the contextual framework of social change and human development. Nonviolence also cannot be wholly understood without understanding violence and its metalogic framework. Again, that's the Galtonian idea. The third was nonviolence cannot be wholly understood unless it is counterposed with the metalogic of violence. That idea is that violence is three, direct, structural, and cultural. I argue that direct violence manifests in a form of tactical action. This is not uh, unique to me. Um, the terms, however, do uh, reflect much of my work, as you'll see, when we juxtapose these two ideas between violence and nonviolence. So with direct violence, there's tactical action, sometimes called strategic action. There's cultural violence, and thus cultural action. And then the third is structural violence, and I use the term ethical action to reflect the type of behavior, human behavior used in these three forms of violence. Interestingly enough, Martin Luther King 
is well known for many things, beyond being a dreamer, beyond being um, the guy who uh, is not Rodney King, let's just all get along, but Martin King, the guy who wants to, to restructure, if you will, the social edifice. He speaks about the triple evils. The triple evils for King are militarism, racism, and poverty. And King sees these as core to uh, the problem of violence that prevents individuals from achieving their full potential and were particularly present during and before and gave rise to the modern civil rights movement in the mid 20th century. The point here is that militarism is a form of direct violence. Racism is a form of cultural violence. And poverty is a form of structural violence. Galtung takes these forms, and again, as we saw, or as I mentioned earlier, he creates the um, violence triangle. And he argues that uh, direct violence is a manifest violence where cultural and structural violence are latent. And that is, they are not immediately recognized. What I do with Galtung's triangle in order to accomplish the juxtaposition or the counterposing of the two ideas, the two logics of violence, is I open, if you will, I open Galtung's triangle with direct violence being the manifest type of violence, as Galtung argues, structural violence and cultural violence also being reflected when we open the triangle. Let's move to nonviolence and see how we make this juxtaposition work. Traditionally, nonviolence has been considered two forms, pragmatic and principled, sometimes called conscientious nonviolence. Pragmatic nonviolence is most often viewed as tactical action. It is the use of violence where actionists or nonviolentists, as they might be called, act uh, through various forms of protest. It is a realist approach to violence, or, or nonviolence rather. It is an external, that is, versus an internal concept. It uses coercive means and sometimes may be viewed as a strategic process. The other form of nonviolence traditionally or putatively understood is principle or that, action, or that ethical action, which is doing or believing an idealist, moral, ethical form. It is more internal. It is persuasive and it is didactic. Martin Luther King and Mohandas K. Gandhi are best known, most known, for the principled form of nonviolence. And Jean Sharp is best known as the father of pragmatic nonviolence. I'll come back to that point in a moment. My dissertation argues that nonviolence, rather than being two concepts, is actually three. That is, again, direct, cultural, and structural, with tactical action for direct nonviolence cultural action and ethical action. And note the elements that pertain to each of these forms, where direct is very pragmatic, again, the using, acting, realist, external, coercive, and strategic elements. Let's go to structural first, a principle doing and believing idealist, internal, persuasive, and didactic approach. The third form of nonviolence is conscientious. It is more about being, about knowing. It is about a humanist approach a, it, a versus an idealist or realist approach. It includes both external and internal elements. It is cognitive 
and it is pedagogic. Thus, nonviolence, I argue, is indeed a meta theory that subsumes these three forms. This approach takes nonviolence as this meta approach. It takes nonviolence, and I even play with the word itself, so that nonviolence without a hyphen becomes this overarching umbrella idea. And its various forms of action, um, whether it's tactical, cultural, or ethical, are reflected in its structural, conscientious, and direct forms. There's an intersection, obviously, in this Venn diagram that we want to hone in on now. That Venn diagram shows us where Galtung's triangle, if this were a violence presentation, would fall and illustrates that nonviolence indeed can be counterposed and understood in the same framework as violence, being direct, structural, and cultural, with the same manifest and latent elements. We can again open the nonviolence triangle and lay it out as a continuum with its manifest and latent <laughs> with and latent forms. This leads us to depicting the actual continuum that is the result of my work and how it fits into and becomes a theory of change. I call this the nonviolence continuum. It's a spectrum that counterposes what we saw in the spectrum where we opened the, the triangle for nonviolence on our left side, and on the right side we have violence, where we open the violence triangle. Note that if you follow the spectrum carefully, there's a nonviolence continuum, a violence continuum. I have got to get used to this slide. I mean this. Okay, and the violence continuum. The idea is Martin Luther King's argument is, and he even writes in his fifth book, the title of his fifth book is Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? And King argues that we always have a choice, that conflict is part of the quotidian experience of human interaction. It is a day in and day out notion. What determines the character of violence or rather of conflict, whether it is violent or nonviolent, is the choice that we make regarding that conflict. And so if there's a crisis, uh, a contradiction, an antagonism, there's a choice to be made. Shall we respond to this crisis or this contradiction violently or nonviolently. In laying out this framework, we see that we have direct nonviolence and its tactical action. We have structural nonviolence and its ethical action, and then the cultural nonviolence and its cultural action. As well, we've laid out the violence framework with the same characteristics that you saw in the previous slide. The argument here is that vi the violence continuum depicts how Cruelty or extre extreme violence, uh, which, may, which manifests as cruelty. I use the work of Etienne Balabar to illustrate this point, that violence in, or, or, or that as societies form and develop, and uh, their systems and structures, organizations and processes that mediate human interaction, uh, play in the lives of, of, of human beings, we they tend to be more communitarian, communitarian and individual, individualistic, atomistic, and bureaucratic, with a bureaucratic res, uh, resilience. On the other hand, on the nonviolent side, nonviolent values tend to be more 
uh, reflective of positive peace, by the way, versus negative peace, with a humanizing process, a cosmopolitan approach that focuses on personalism and a trans individual between and among individuals with a permanent insurgence. Permanent insurgence here is a term from Etienne Balabar, who talks about uh, anti-violence as a form of negating violence, which gives us the construct for cultural uh, nonviolence and its cultural action. This framework is central to understanding Martin Luther King's work and the relevance of nonviolence, I believe, to our field. It illustrates that the traditional form of nonviolence, the putative idea, excuse yes, the putative idea of, of nonviolence as being resistance, of being direct action, of being protest, brings us to the title of the dissertation, that is, after confrontation, then what? Too much work has gone into the notion that nonviolence is only a confrontational tool, and that when it is not confrontational, when it is viewed as a moral or ethical framework, it is too otherworldly. It has no real significance to the human experience. Moreover, not everyone holds the same moral values or principles or ideas. And so how then can it really be effective and relevant when there are different points of view on what is ethical, what is uh, of, of real value, uh, or what are those values that are, ought to guide and direct human behavior? But if we look at nonviolence as a continuum and we understand that all human society, all human systems and structures are based upon some value system. And th the argument of the dissertation is that most of human history, in a very significant and specific way, has evolved in very violent forms. When there were alternative options, and that if we're going to truly experience a change in our social uh, situation in, our, in, in societies, we've got to determine, as King argued, whether that change will occur through chaos, that is violence, or community, or nonviolence. What I sought to do here is to lay out at least a framework to understand how nonviolence can be institutionalized in the same way or become structural in the same way that violence has been institutionalized and is structural and is part of the day in and day out life experience of humans. That is my presentation. Real easy. I've been trying to follow you for a long time. <laughs> I love this. Uh, okay. What, one of the things that, uh, I really enjoy working with you on this. It's, it's, it's a real, uh, you know, an intellectual highlight, I would say. It's, it's been fun. Uh, and what, one of the interesting things I found was uh, there was a lot of convergence between directions I've been going in my thinking and, mm. and, and what I was reading in your book. Uh, the main difference is yours is a lot more sophisticated. But, uh, I, I, and I, I want to try to to bring your non-violence triangle down a little bit to earth and uh, ask you to do a little uh, thinking off the cuff about that. I'm going to back up just, just a little bit. Uh, I think the, the one, one place, in addition to the sophistication, the other difference between what, what you're doing and what I've been thinking about in terms of nonviolence is that, um, well, you start with King, I start with Gandhi. And what I see Gandhi doing 
uh, is he takes things that are contradictory and puts them together and creates something new. So the way, I, the way I'm looking at God is yes, the warrior and the pastor are two contradictory ways of, of thinking about change. Well, am I going to use violence to fight or am I going to be a pacifist and I can't use violence? And both of those have their dilemmas. So what Gandhi does is he creates the nonviolent activist who fights like the warrior does, but avoids harming like the pacifist. Um, so I guess part of part of what I was originally hoping you would do is that you take the principled and the pragmatic as the contradictory ways of thinking about nonviolence, and then you come up with the conscientious nonviolence as kind of synthesis of the two. So I, I'm still I'm still trying to figure out the difference between how I envisioned your project along those lines and your spectrum. Now I, I get the spectrum from you know, the beloved community on the one hand, on the one hand to firm nuclear war on the other. And I get that kind of the extreme violence versus the, I guess the beloved community is extreme nonviolence. Yes. Um, but I'm still I'm still trying to figure out exactly what those three kinds of nonviolence are, the cultural, structural, and direct. And if I start with with Galton's violence triangle, where I always do when I think about violence, um, and then I try to think of when I it's easier to think to bring Galton's triangle down to earth. You know, think, okay, what's direct violence? War, sexual assault, assault, you know, kind of. Anyway, and so, but if I begin, I want to think, so, tell some about what what concretely is uh, are those three kinds of nonviolence? Now, I I like the where you went with the militarism, racism, and, and with the trick leaders. That that begins to get. I'm almost done. The, the, the one thing that I think, if we're trying to bring it down to the concrete, structural violence, structural, not, structural violence is the harm that's done by the social structures. Right? So structural nonviolence, it seems to me, has to do with structuring society in such a way that it doesn't harm, mm -hmm. that, that enables mm -hmm. Grace, mm -hmm. dignity, and worth. Right. Uh, so, what are the concrete? If we look those three legs of the triangle. What are the concrete things, and how do we get there? Mm -hmm. I guess that's maybe how do we get there is the next sure. book. Sure. Shall I respond to that first? When I started out the presentation, I mentioned King's idea that uh, his idea of peaceable power. And King argues that direct action, which is our first form of, 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 of uh, direct nonviolence, is necessary and will always be required. But he also indicates that it's not sufficient, that it cannot bring the resolution of the conflict that African Americans and Americans are experiencing. And so he's looking for what will bring it. Now, remember that King also argues that he argues for love and he argues for cooperation and he, he argues for various ethical or moral ideas very much in the same way that Gandhi does. And so rather than taking the, if you will, the Sharpian approach of, of mere transactional, instrumental activities in order to coerce an opponent to do that which the opponent would not otherwise do. And I, by the way, a, a, an issue of power, something we just didn't have time to, to, to get into here. There's a certain element of attitude uh, and approach in that attitude in the second form or face, if you will, of nonviolence which is this ethical or principled form. It is not significantly unlike 
the direct form of nonviolence very often in action, but it is very different in attitude and in motivation, which has a profound impact not only on the actionist, the person carrying out the activity, but on the opponent, as has been demonstrated uh, both in Gandhi's situation, but more particularly in the U.S. Civil Rights Movement. Now the question really comes then, but what about this third piece? In the work that I do, it is not just King who's looking for an answer to how to use nonviolence. Uh, nonviolence uh, it w was not new to King. There were many who were working uh, during the Civil Rights Movement for justice and equality uh, using nonviolent principles. In fact, there's a certain attitude or framework within the African American community because of the segregation and the separation of communities where African Americans are forced to think in ways that would otherwise not be necessary. They had to set up their own framework, their own institutional and social and structural frameworks. Those frameworks not only had to serve and provide for the community, but they also had to be a bridge, a nexus between the African American community and the broader community. These are the axial processes that I talked about earlier. And so you'll find in, or I, the, the dissertation argues, you'll find elements, tangible elements of conscientious nonviolence and its cultural action in those axial processes. And those processes are dialogical, they are uh, communicative, um, that is, the dialogue within the community they are uh, diffusional, diffusing information about nonviolence, information about the situation that we find ourselves in, in an oppressed society, for example. Um, these processes became part of the very fabric of the movement that were not codified by, by any uh, organized process, but became a very organic uh, way of African Americans situating themselves and addressing the problem of segregation or what the dissertation calls American apartheid. Then there's Balibar, as you know, I use the theoretical framework of both Paulo Freire and Etienne Balibar. In the case of Freire, it is the, it is the idea of critical consciousness, the idea of becoming critically aware of the power asymmetries and those things that, that are under the, the, that line of manifest versus latent uh, violence or nonviolence, whichever the case may be, that, that we may not be fully aware are impacting our ability to really exercise that personhood, that freedom, and enjoy the community that comes in a civil society. It requires negating the structural violence that um, is also, again, latent uh, and driven by cultural proclivities and mores and norms that we accept as being just the way things are. That critical consciousness, that becoming aware of uh, these power asymmetries, if you will, um, that draw distinctions, for example, between those who have and those who don't have in terms of um, um, the goods that life offers. So, so uh, this, you raise another question. So uh, I like when you talk about how these ideas emerge out of the African American community. <laughs> uh, and there are certain sort of structural conditions of that community that mm -hmm. enabled King and the Civil Rights Movement to develop this right. perspective. The uh, peace and conflict academic community is is pretty much a community of privilege. Yes. So so are, what are what are the obstacles for taking your framework into a different kind of community? Well it's How the, the, the obstacles are people like you and me who uh, 
settle for the status quo, who, who well, like me, not like you. That's <laughs> okay. But if you think about the civil rights movement, you think about King himself, the willingness to speak out, for example, on the war in Vietnam, that itself was a form of conscientization, not only within the African-American community, but King moves from civil rights to human rights. And that is a process of dialogue and diffusion of nonviolence principles. King is strategically trying to educate and form didactically and pedagogically society and to transform through that critical consciousness. And, 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 and in fact, it, 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 it's, it's quite arguable, well, not quite arguable, but King had a profound impact on the whole peace movement which, which, which followed the civil rights movement as a result of that pedagogic didactic process. The question is, uh, I believe it's, it's Adam Curl. Uh, I talk about Doug Bond uh, and, and others in our field who are also writing, not directly in terms of nonviolence, but they're writing about the idea that we have to think differently, for example, about our political science because our own political science is part of that status quo structure of atomistic, individualistic, market-driven, uh, dare I say it, capitalist approach uh, uh, to uh, you know, modern industrialized economies that really dictate who we are, what we do, and how we do it, how we think, how we act, uh, how we interact as a society that determines those who have and those who don't. Even when it's against our own interest, we'd rather have a handful of, a, literally a handful of the very wealthy in the hopes that our, or that we, or our children, or our children's children will win the lottery and become part of that handful, rather than to think differently about a conscience, or th th through a conscientiousness process, a critical thinking process, um, and I think the field has to come to be grips with it, not only in terms of political science, but also in terms of, of, of peace and conflict, conflict analysis and resolution. Well, I have about 20 more questions, but I think I should <laughs> defer to my colleagues. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I enjoyed the uh, presentation almost as much as the dissertation. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. So actually, my questions really follow in the same in Lesser's footsteps. I'm going to let me state this a little bit differently. Um, uh, really, the starting point here is the starting point that um, I've heard you talk about this many times in, in my classes <laughs> and in other places as a guest lecturer and stuff. Um, here's Gene Sharp um, saying, well, nonviolence is this really neat technique, uh, which basically you can use for anything. Um, you want to make a socialist revolution, maybe you can use it to do that. You want to make a capitalist revolution, maybe you can do that. Maybe you can even, maybe Donald Trump can figure that out. Um, it's, a, it's a heavy emphasis, I'm being, you know, exaggerating a bit, but it's a heavy emphasis on means as yes. opposed to ends, ends. As, on technique as opposed to principles. So then you have King and, and his predecessor, Gandhi, saying, no, wait a minute, uh, we're interested in principles, uh, not violence. We won't, we can't detach means from ends in, in this way. Um, and so we want to do the kind of nonviolence that con converts the enemy into a friend, that, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and all sorts of questions are left open by this, and part of what I, what I understand you're, you to be doing in this uh, dissertation is to, in some ways, to give uh, an answer to the um, purely strategic, uh, to the realists, uh, which is not 
convincingly given by the principles of nonviolence people. Um, or to go further. Right. To take a step further. And that step further, using ma materials that are there in King's writings, but especially in the writings on the war and in the writings on, on, uh, on society, on social change, to kind of take the next step, which is the step towards the positive peace step. Yes. Um, and so you come up with this very interesting kind of synthesis, if I could put it, that are conscientious yes. um, nonviolence. So what I find myself asking as you go through this is, uh, and I ask this because it's a kind of characteristic of our field that politically when politics are concerned, we like to speak in code here. We know who the good guys and the bad guys are, and we don't want to use those kinds of terms. So we just assume that, for example, when you use a word like community, that you mean the kind of community that a left-winger like me and many people in this room would be happy uh, to be associated with. People who, for example, uh, want to share uh, material things with each other. Uh, whereas there are other people in the world and in the country who, when they, when they use a term like community, might have a different take on it. They might think um, either material things are unimportant, it doesn't matter who, who owns or doesn't own them, or they might think um, if we all believe in the same creed, we, we have a kind of community that you don't have when you don't have people believing in the same version of the Gospels or, or what have you. So as soon as you start to make things concrete in the way that Les was asking you to do, you begin to say things like, uh, use words like capitalism or words like militarism um, and, or words like poverty. Um, if you go around the corner here to the people at the Mercatus Center, uh, you'll find they, they would agree poverty is a bad thing too, um, but um, they would believe that collective action to solve that problem is, is not what should be done. Uh, the only action that, the, the action that solves that problem is the action of the free market, period. So anyway, as I listen to you expound on this, I'm wondering what is the connection really between the means and the end? That is to say, nonviolence as a, a, a non, the kind of nonviolence that you're talking about, you, I think you answered, Gene, you answered the less very well, doesn't get realized until it becomes structure. Right. Until it becomes part of the structure, until it becomes part of the culture. Yes. So that we're not just talking about nonviolent protests anymore. We're talking about nonviolent life, uh, a nonviolent society, a culture of peace. Um, even so, um, to what extent does that dictate a politics? Ah, uh, yeah. Which is a kind of like asking if you know you're, you're thinking about King. And somebody asked me once, well, King was surrounded by leftists when he was yeah. kind of coming up. Um, so what, what kind of, was he a leftist? Mm, yes. And you know, I think so. Um, but there in, you end up with a kind of open-ended, I won't say empty, it's not empty, but it's very general and kind of tending towards vague huh. description of political goals. Okay. All right, which is bothersome in, if, it, if it opens the door to anybody to do any kind of politics they feel like, mm -hmm. for any purpose they feel like, mm -hmm. then it, that is bothersome. Okay. So, which piece of that Simple questions. <laughs> Very easy question to ask. But 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 I get it, Rich. 
I think, you know, obviously this is a very complicated, it's a very complex issue. <laughs> and to, your, to, to the latter part of your question about politics, there's a negative politics and a positive politics that is part of the framework of this whole idea of nonviolence. And the, the negative politics is like negative peace, tantamount to negative peace, and the politi positive politics is similar to positive peace. Uh, and there are also ideas of what I call, not unique to me, I think it's Balabar, uh, the anthropological institutions of life. Violence has the same framework, I argue, as does nonviolence. We don't argue, we don't argue the emptiness of structural violence, but we'll argue the emptiness of structural nonviolence. And that's, I think, really where King, what King was trying to get at, and it's certainly what I'm trying to get at in this logic. We don't argue the values of violence, but we argue the values of, or as, as, as being irrelevant. But we'll argue the values of nonviolence as being irrelevant. We, we don't argue that there is a didactic, pedagogic, educative process in all of our institutional structures and systems that tend to produce a very violent world in many ways, whether it's through classism or racism or the various isms. But we'll argue that a pedagogic, didactic, educative process on the nonviolent side is unrealistic. What gives here? What's, what's going on here? So the whole thrust of the dissertation is to counterpose these two and to show that that's a problem. And that gets back to the beginning of my presentation where, where, where I make the point, or at least try to make the point, that we, that violence is a process that is part of the the, the very fabric of our society and it is monopolized by the state and as the dissertation argues if you can monopolize the powers of the state then you become part of that monopolizing process and if we uh, if violence is monopolized by the state converted by the state into a civil society. That is, we use violence only when absolutely necessary in order to sustain a civil society. That's basically the argument. Why can't the same be true of, 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 of nonviolence? And so, Rich, the point here has to do with where the monopoly of nonviolence lies, and it's an issue of power. Sharp and those who uh, less deal with direct violence argue that the power asymmetries are really what is the problem and that if enough people resist long enough, as was the case in the 381 day bus boycott, we can make a change. But that change only happens on the periphery or on the surface. It is not sufficient, direct violence, direct nonviolence, I argue, and I argue that King argues, is not sufficient to drill down. It doesn't have the depth and breadth capacity to make the change structurally. And so guys like Etienne Balabar and Paulo Ferre say, well, shucks, let's use, in, in fact, they are the sharps of cultural nonviolence or conscientious nonviolence. They're saying let's use the same pedagogic, didactic, educative, institutional frameworks that are used on the other side of the spectrum. What we don't and what we haven't figured out, and I think what King was trying to figure out, is how to institutionalize that. And so thus the dissertation tries to give that answer. And it tries to give that answer when King argues and uses 
segregation, desegregation. I'm almost finished, Kevin. I know this is a long answer, so I apologize. No, there's only one question. <laughs> okay. When King argues that segregation, which uh, desegregation isn't enough, he argues that we must have integration. So desegregation ends the segregation, but it doesn't integrate all into community. And so something else must happen. Uh, and that's the same with, or it's tantamount to, or a metaphor for our idea of vi violence and nonviolence. Um, that we must find ways to institutionalize and to systematize a value framework. And by the way, whose values? Well, King argues there, again, there are only three. F personhood, freedom, and community. Um, the question is, how do we make those part of the woof and warp of the very fabric of society? And that's through a critical consciousness. That same critical consciousness, we are critically conscious about the politics of the status quo. We're very critically consciousness about the politics of the market economy. We're very critically conscious about, you know, capitalist, uh, democratic capitalism as we practice it in the West. I'm not saying these are good or bad. I'm simply saying that's what we have. But we can also become critically conscious, uh, uh, critically conscious about alternative systems and structures that are more humanizing and provide the opportunity for individuals to achieve their full potential. Did that make any sense? Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's, that's so there, there really is a single question. Um, so this is basically um, a dissertation of ideas. Mm -hmm. It is, in, in, in many, many ways, idealist in the Hegelian sense of the old Yes. Idea. Yes. And so, like all idealistic alien works, mm -hmm. it's susceptible to the Marxist critique of yeah. why we stand it on its head and see yeah. how it connects to the world. Yeah. That's why I say it's the same thing. Um, so, as you know, probably because of my own biases, as you know, back in the day of field anthropology. Yes. Um, I really pushed you to talk about the civil rights movement, which, yes. which, which you did, and I think it's a very evocative way. And, and what I'm going to say really looks forward to, to what the book, How I Can Human Strength. But I really would like to see more about King's ideas developing in the crucible of the civil rights movement in, in two senses. First of all, you refer to, I thought it was very telling, I wish you'd done another three pages on it. You refer to the fact that nonviolence succeeded brilliantly in Selma with Will Connors and the dogs. But it failed in Albany, Georgia, when, and I forgot the name of that sheriff, when that sheriff had really Laurie Pritchett. and responded to right. nonviolence with, by imposing tremendous self-control on his own forces and his own deployment of violence. And in many ways, it, it, it diffused what Dr. King was trying to do in Albany. And I think from that, that was part of, since we're all getting inside of his hand, right? I can too, I think that was part of his decision to think even more deeply about nonviolence in terms of what the three evils were. Because he saw it was sharply a nonviolence. That's right. Right, okay? That's right. And I saw that it's implicit in your dissertation, but you really need to Got to it. do that. The other thing that I think you really need to do, although they were wary, respectfully wary of each other and rarely wanted to directly engage, you have to talk about either the serial monologues or the dialogues that were happening between Dr. King and Malcolm X about violence. Because I think both of them taught the other or challenged and in some ways, um, Malcolm won. 
in the sense that what happened to Core and SNCC and so forth was, was more reflected in the genealogy of black power, black nationalism, not more change the beloved community. And, and of course, part of the reason why that happened is because racism didn't go away and the Oakland police remained the Oakland police and, and, and so on. But there, but there is a sense in which looking at the, the civil rights black rhetoric of violence, and especially what came later, would be interesting. Not, not, not central, but, but, but I think interesting. So my question is, um, and it's the same question, it's the, you know, Marxian question to a Hegelian dissertation, is um, well, first of all, uh, what is really missing from it is you, I think you talk about the evils of militarism and racism but the third evil was poverty. And that's even for Galton, where st structural violence lies, right? I mean, children dying not because they're murdered, but because the well is polluted and, right, and they're poor. Children flint. Um, so what's, what's missing here is a real confrontation with nonviolence and, in fact, class and political economy. Because mm -hmm. King was certainly headed in that direction. And what he left was what he And uh, I don't see that. Because he's murdered before that could right. go any, right. any further. But that's something that if your, your, your project is to extend his thought into maybe what it would have been had he not been murdered, uh, that's something that you need to, to attend to. Sure. Um, and I think that was part of just. Yeah, he was murdered. He was murdered supporting strikers. Right. That's yeah. Not, not, yeah. Not. Un, un, unrelated. But my question is, and I'm going to force you here. <laughs> okay. Uh, last time I got a chance to force you. So you've taken these two fairly well established binaries, right? Tactical nonviolence, pragmatic nonviolence, and principle nonviolence. Kind of nonviolence of means as opposed to nonviolence of uh, ends. And you've turned it into a tripartite thing, you know, which is, has a long intellectual history. Great, a trinity. Uh, what would uh, the civil rights movement, the next one, look like if all three faces of your nonviolence were invoked or were actual? Ah. So, so. If I may, the problem with the question, the problem with the question is that it, it assumes a movement. That is, it insists that there's an element of movement as we understand it in the 20th century term is the only way to affect the social change we're seeking. That's the point of the dissertation, that, that the movement is tantamount to a protest, uh, uh, resistance, and King argues, the dissertation argues, yes, that is necessary, but it's not sufficient. So the next movement, if you will, if, if, if we look at Etienne Balabar, he talks about the idea of a permanent insurgency. So the next movement is a permanent insurgency. We have a permanent insurgency right now on the violence side, and it's called resilience of the status quo. That's the permanent insurgency that ensures the 1% and the 99, if I can be a, a bit hyperbolic. And so the next movement, uh, uh, Freire would argue, is a critical consciousness that comes from the wellspring of civil society. And that's what was happening in the mid 20th century civil rights movement. And it was happening in the African American community, which is why some argued even then that the African American community had the answer to, the, to not only the poverty problem, but to the whole colonial imperialist system. That, 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 that they're thinking not just about pro protests, and to your point about King and X, that's part of this, this 
axial process. King and X are, are having this social dialogue that's informing the African-American community in the same way, if you will, that, that uh, um, Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. They're having the, the, a similar social dialogue. And civil society is listening to this dialogue. That is a, that is a pedagogic dialogical process taking place. And it is educating a constituency that may, if, may permanently change the political process. That's part of cultural action. I'm not articulate enough in 20 minutes to say it from that stand. If you read the dissertation, perhaps it will give a bit better. But so the, the next movement will probably be, and, and by the way, I make a distinction between movements and campaigns. We have the Black Lives Matter movement, as it's so-called. I, I don't think it's a movement. I think it's a, it's a bunch of discrete campaigns that may someday become a movement. But having this permanent emancipatory insurgency that's part of the woof and woof of the fabric of our daily lives that comes through civil society institutions, including academia. So the next movement is academics. The next movement is a school of nonviolence that looks at these ideas critically and systematically, that comes to realize that an organization called Search for Common Ground is doing cultural action and doesn't even know it, and doesn't know what to do with it. And if we can identify more and more of those and point that out and study it and teach it to others, we can inform a whole network institutionally within civil society who doesn't know that it has a force more powerful called nonviolence. And that nonviolence is not so much nonviolent <laughs> resistance and protest, but it is a nonviolent attitude about being conscious of those things that limit my life chances and the life chances of my children and my children's children. That's nonviolence. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a robust answer, and it's exactly the kind of thing that you have to have the last chapter of your book. Yes. Okay. Don't worry about normativity and all that. Let's entertain some, some questions. And I'll let you call on Oh, any questions? Yes. Dr. Elliot Tomby? Don't be so hard as they were. I'm your friend, remember? <laughs> First of all, congratulations. Well, thank you. It's just a pleasure to see this evolve, this project evolve. Um, and it's not even just a flawed project. It is such a contribution to the field. Not only of course, but all developed to this project. It's not just taking Keep in mind that my dissertation is speaking directly to the field of peace and conflict. And so operationalization is first understanding the theory of it all. You know, do we have a palpable theory, something we can put our arms around and teach, and 
can that translate into you know real reflective practice or praxis? Uh, so my argument here is operalization is again an educative process. It is it is for me. M my response is we need a school of nonviolence uh, to study these very forms of violence and nonviolence and how they interact and to in the same way that we look for ways of dialogue of narrative of appreciative inquiry we need to look for ways of operationalizing um, forms of cultural ethical and um, tactical nonviolence um, and we need to identify them in the field. They're already operationalized. Like I mentioned Search for Common Ground, which you know well. They're doing certain forms of cultural action as I've defined it in the dissertation. It hasn't been identified as that within the literature, first of all. Um, and very few, few people understand it. Um, systematically examining it, writing about it, teaching it, um, studying it, evaluating it, I think is part of that process. Did I did I answer your question? Okay. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Um, so I also focus on nonviolence. Great. Um, but I also just come from Jordan. I did a trip to learn their Syrian. So my question for you is, I'm kind of wanting to write a paper about um, the failure of the armed rebellion system, because not like the not violent movements, they're, so for example, let's see there's like 4,000 armed groups in like eight, they're not working together. Um, so I kind of thinking like, these armed groups, if they really want to be successful, they should kind of use some of these not violent strategies. Sharp talks about the So, and it's kind of like a little bit of no, no. You know, bringing armed and non violence together. So, if I understand your question, part of the argument in the dissertation has to do with this space right here. That is, I can't, it, I can't remember who the person is, and I, I, I really wish I could pull it, who argues that the greatest form of nonviolence non -violence is the greatest form of violence. Nonviolence is the greatest form of violence. Cody, the philosopher. Is that who it is? Yeah, what does that mean? Uh, certainly, nonviolent direct action can be coercive. Is that violent? When does nonviolence become violence? And when is violence, dare I say it, nonviolent? Is just war, as uh, Patrick Coy Lester argues, is just war a form of nonviolence? Um, the dissertation approaches a conversation on this, but doesn't examine it thoroughly. Pardon me? The Pope, no, he doesn't. <laughs> you know, but, but the point is this, and I, 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 I wish I could make it better than I am. We live here, we human beings, and we venture over here in times of crisis. We, when we talk about violence and nonviolence, we tend to focus here. And there needs to be more attention out here, structurally and culturally. It, it, if, if, and so when we teach nonviolence, when we talk about nonviolence, the first thing we want to do is take, I have nothing, I don't have a problem with Gene Sharp. I just feel that if, if all of our conversation, if you know, it's like a one-legged uh, 
or a three-legged dog, or I'm not using the right metaphor here, but <laughs> that's the wrong one, Terrence. <laughs> okay, 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 I get it. The problem is we, we handicap ourselves, and that was King's argument. We're handicapping ourselves. There are other forms, in fact, arguably more useful and practical if we can find ways to instill them and institutionalize them. Whenever I talk to people, uh, particularly out in the field, the first thing they want to know is, what kind of protest do I do nonviolently in order to solve my conflict? Well, it, if, we, if we thought differently about what nonviolence is and what violence is, and understood the limitations of direct action in that form, and we understood that violence takes time, even war takes its own time, you know, to be fully prosecuted. And so does nonviolence. We simply don't have the patience. We want nonviolence to be instant, but we'll take as long as we need with violence. And so it's, it's rethinking, it's restructuring our consciousness, if you will, Paulo Freire, um, about how to effect lasting social change that humanize um, our systems and structures rather than dehumanizing them. Yes? So uh, I'm going to point out something that I know is not quite part of your presentation, however, I'm sure I can your research, as you mentioned, is this idea of liberation of theology. Yes. Uh, yeah. I yes. Um, he mentioned liberation of theology, and it's not quite part of this dissertation at the same time. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so you're talking about this restructuring of consciousness. Yes. And for me, when I think of that, I think of Einstein's quote that you cannot solve a problem with the same consciousness that you had when you created it. Yeah. Um, so with this idea of liberation theology, I wonder if that isn't a route to begin to address specific communities, i.e. that would be the Christian community, in terms of creating this new consciousness. Because I think that as a systematic critical theory approach would indicate you have to overthrow the system in some way or another, and through nonviolent means, you introduce new ideas. Sure. So was that a route that came up either in your hypothesizing or well, kind of related to King? You know, obviously King you know, was a theologian, if you will, and you know, a Christian cleric. Um, and during that time, liberation theology and um, the social gospel, you know, zygotic twin, dizygotic, I guess, uh, of, that, of, of that era. Um, and they have a value system themselves that could be, be considered nonviolent values. The problem there is it works if, if you subscribe to that particular belief system. What happens when you don't? And so, you know, if, are there universal principles or values sufficiently universal, whatever that might mean, um, that respect the, the dignity and worth of humans? And that itself is a core value. So my answer to your question is, I think that that you know, liberation theology and the social gospel played a major role in the mid 20th century. I think less so today because you know, I think people think very differently about religion today than they did, particularly in the Western world, than they did in, in the mid 20th century. Carol, did I see your hand? Exist. 
all to exist on all that um, uh, respected, or all that uh, uh, continuum, as you call it, and cultural nonviolence exists as well. Uh, structural nonviolence exists at a certain level during certain times, during certain stages of this conflict. And I agree with you, direct nonviolence and direct violence are the most um, visible ones, at least to most people. So my question is, following what, uh, and, and, and I, I value very much that triangle of Gauteng, and I do believe that, first of all, we have to stop the direct violence in order to achieve other levels of uh, structural and cultural, as uh, I do not foresee that you can work on cultural and violence while direct violence is happening all the time. So that's at least my personal assumption of, of, of how things my question again, following up, how would it look like if all three exist at the same time, and not necessarily a nonviolent movement or civil resistance movement? Look at the Arab world, right? Look at the, how, how, how do you suggest from this, from, from this powerful presentation, how do you suggest it would look like? It doesn't have to be a group. It could be a government, it could be uh, whatever. How, how do you? How did it look like? How do you imagine it? Okay, Carol. If, if if I understand your question, are are you asking in any given situation, like the like the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, since you're recognizing that these forms, as I've described them, do currently exist, yes, which is the point. The question is, how do you systematize them? How do you routinize them? Right. How do they become part of the, the very fabric? Right. And that's a function of power. And that power, again, comes from civil society. So what it looks like is an engaged, active, informed civil society. The dissertation argues that civil society has been co-opted by the other two major social frameworks government and the, and, and the private sector. In fact, civil society has simply become, it's funded by, it's driven by, its agendas are even, to a large extent, academia is, you know, suffers from a similar problem, I would argue. What it looks like is uh, a civil society that um, is engaged socially, actively, um, and I think there are other times, particularly in the Western world, if you think about um, even the American Revolution, for example, or the French Revolution, you have an engaged civil society uh, who's anxious to see some significant change because of the accumulation and concentration of power that's had an impact on the quality of lives. I think that's happening right now in the U.S. today. Um, we don't have the framework, we don't have the social framework to respond to it. Um, if King had lived, what would the Southern Christian Leadership Conference look like today, for example? How different would it be? Um, how different would his theory be? Uh, you know, I, I don't know what it would look like. I can look at, back at the Civil Rights Movement to go back to your point about Kevin's question. And I think Kevin is absolutely right. There's more to be mined. There are more golden nuggets to be mined out of the U.S. Civil Rights Movement and what was actually going on in that community, in the African-American community, as it was, it was it's no genius. If you think about James C. Scott's work, Weapons of the, of, of the um, Weak, you know, these are people desperate for emancipation who, who do um, Spinoza, it is the something minimum. It is the, what is it, Dr. Avruk? The something minimum. This, this, this inner thing that I can't, I'm sorry I brought it up because I can't pull the term. But it is this, 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 sub, let me say it this way. <laughs> Nothing splendid, I say this often, has ever been achieved except by those 
who dare believe that something inside themselves is superior to circumstances. And that's what was happening in the civil rights movement. You know, African Americans, and in fact, in any movement, I've gone this far and no further. We're gonna find a way, whatever we have to do, we're gonna find a way. Some choose a violent path, others choose a nonviolent path. What it looks like is a civil society that says, I've had enough. Um, I, won't, I won't rely on violence. The argument here is to equip civil society with a theory and practice to rely on nonviolence. So you're arguing that the solution is bottom-up? Uh, I think it's both and, but I think it, it is re-empowering and taking back the power that is inherently in civil society. I, I invite you to continue this, but maybe has to go <laughs> into my office okay. and do some magic. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.